Many are inquiring, how am I to make the surrender of myself to God? You desire to give yourself to Him, but you are weak in moral power, in slavery to doubt, and controlled by the habits of your life of sin. Your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. You cannot control your thoughts, your impulses, your affections. The knowledge of your broken promises and forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity and causes you to feel that God cannot accept you. But you need not despair. What you need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision or of choice. Everything depends on the right action of the will. The power of choice God has given to men. It is theirs to exercise. You cannot change your heart. You cannot of yourself give to God its affections, but you can choose to serve him. You can give him your will. He will then work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Thus your whole nature will be brought under the control of the Spirit of Christ. Amen. Your affections will be centered on Him. Amen. Your thoughts will be in harmony with Him. Amen. Desires for goodness and holiness are right as far as they go. But if you stop here, they will avail nothing. Many will be lost while hoping and desiring to be Christians. They do not come to the point of yielding the will to God. They do not now choose to serve him. Through the right exercise of the will, an entire change may be made in your life. Amen. By yielding up the will to Christ, Amen. you ally yourself with the power that is above all principalities and powers. You will have strength from above to hold you steadfast. Amen. And thus, through constant surrender to Christ, Amen. you will be enabled to live the new life, Amen. even the life of faith. Amen. Steps to Christ, page 47, paragraphs 1 and 2, page 48, paragraph 1. I thank God for the gift of life Amen. and for the tremendous honor of being asked to speak for him. It would be an honor to speak for your head of state. If you're in England, Boris Johnson. If you're in uh, Japan, Prime Minister Suga. If you're United States, uh, Joe Biden. But to be asked to speak for God is a tremendous honor. And I recognize that and I thank God. And I will try with my limited abilities, but mingled with the power of God, to represent him aright by presenting to you Thus saith the Lord. It may not be what you want to hear, but it will certainly be what you need. You know, sometimes when I go to the dentist and he needs to do something, he hides the needle from me. <laughs> because the needle is this long, <laughs> you understand? Some people, they try to hide from the Word of God, but that's exactly what you need. Because this will set you free. John 8, 32, John 8, 36. And the only thing it will free you from is bondage to sin and bondage to error. Wherever you are, thank you for joining us. We are almost at the end of two weeks of revival here at the Houston International SDA Church or Seventh-day Adventist Church in Houston, Texas. Our first week was by Pastor Cerns, who is elsewhere serving the Lord now, and I am your Humble servant, Randy Skeet, the visiting evangelist with responsibility for the second week. And we end tomorrow, so we hope after God blesses you tonight, you will come back for more of a spiritual feast. May God bless whatever country you're in. I don't know what they are, but God knows, and God is right where you are with you. Please don't doubt that. If your children are with you, may the Lord specially bless those little boys and little girls. Let me address any visitors who may be watching. We're grateful for your presence, and may the Lord bless you. I say that with great sincerity. May the Lord bless you. We're always honored as Seventh-day Adventists to have guests among us in a building or via this format of worshiping God. So thank you very much 
for joining us. I have some significant information to give you tonight, but also quite simple. The gospel of God is as simple as ABC. It really, really is. But for some reason, or reasons best known to God, people try to make it difficult. But the gospel of God is as simple as ABC. Uh, after the service tonight, there will be a Zoom meeting during which I will be able to interact with you. You can ask questions. Then tomorrow, we hope you will come if you've made up your mind to follow Christ. Perhaps you're at the point where you need to be baptized. You will come tomorrow if you're in the area so that we can interact face to face. But remember tonight, immediately after the sermon, there will be a Zoom interaction, and I hope you will stay for that. Tomorrow, for those in this area, I'll be here to meet with you either before or after the service so that we can talk and perhaps answer any questions or address any concerns you may have. The devil will try to present you with all kinds of reasons why you should not give your life to Jesus. Ignore all of them and concentrate your mind on surrendering your life to God. Amen. Your life belongs to God on two bases. One, creation Two, the redemption of Jesus Christ. So I hope to see you tonight and tomorrow. Our subject for this evening, steps to Christ. Very simple, steps to Christ. Before I get into that message, as always, I ask you to do three little favors for me. They're not burdensome. One, wherever you are, try to preserve reverence. God does not change because of physical location or electronic format. God is God under all circumstances. Let's give him the reverence that he deserves. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. I need that help. The more you pray, the more power. The Bible says, you know, 10 or 5 will put 100 to flight, 10 will put 10,000 to flight. So if you pray for me, God will answer your prayer and I will benefit from that answered prayer. Amen. And that request is based on Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. Amen. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Amen. I will keep my words to myself and give you in so far as I can. Thus saith the Lord. Amen. Favor number three, think as you listen. Don't just sit there mechanically or stand wherever you are. Think. Be active. Interact as you listen to the words from God. Let's bow our heads now and pray. Father in heaven, in heaven means the place of universal control and power. Our Father, which art in heaven, not the White House Father, not the Kremlin, not number 10 Downing Street, or wherever the earthly centers of power exist, our Father which art in heaven. We come to you because you've invited us to come boldly to the throne of grace. We come, we ask immediately, God, accept our thanks for life and forgive our sins. Our only problem, dear God, is sin. Forgive us, Father. It's your joy to forgive. That's why Jesus died. I present myself to you, God. My burden, it's a heavy burden to preach the words of life. And I am a sinner, I'm weak. You be my strength. You be my voice. You be my power, dear God. Don't just give me power. Father, you be my power. Touch everyone listening, Father. Because you love them. And you want them saved. Be particularly close to that man who has been struggling with the decision to come to you. Or that woman, that boy, that girl. Unleash your spirit upon them in love. That the spirit will bring them to the point of surrender. Because surrendering to God is a life-saving act. Now, Father, we thank you for the restoration of electricity in Houston and other parts of Texas. Fix the water problem, dear God, through human agents, Father. That the suffering may come to an end. But we thank you for life. Now, God, I commit this service to your glory. Speak through me. Take all the glory, dear God. But give us what we need so urgently, and that is the blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our subject for this evening, Steps to Christ. 
Go with me to Nehemiah. The book of Nehemiah. We shall focus on chapter 2, reading from verse 1. The book, Nehemiah. And I read from the King James Version of the Bible. Nehemiah, chapter 2, reading from verse 1. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why art thou sad? Now Nehemiah wants, Artaxerxes wants to know, Why is Nehemiah looking so sad? Because the verse 1 ends with, I had not been before time sad in his presence. Artaxerxes had never seen Nehemiah looking unhappy. And he concludes, this is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Artaxerxes concludes, and correctly, something is wrong on the inside. That's why you look like that. Let me give you a principle that you and I cannot break. Whatever is on the inside invariably and inevitably comes out. Now we may try with all our carnal skills to disguise it. It comes out in some form or fashion. This happens in art. A painter may paint a picture. His style comes out even if he tries to stop it. A writer writes a book, his style comes out. A musician writes a piece, his or her style comes out. What's inside cannot be prevented from coming out eventually. And Nehemiah's sadness, I'm sure he tried to disguise it because his work required him to look happy. Why do I say that? He was the king's cupbearer. On occasion, he would taste the wine. In case it was poisoned, he would die, not the king. Now, if he looked unhappy, the king may suspect, well, something is wrong with the food or the wine. It was not to his advantage to look unhappy in the presence of the king. And so the king said, why art thou sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Something is happening in here. Let me come right to the point. Why have you stopped coming to church? That's outward. Something is going on in here. Why have you stopped returning a tithe? Something is happening in here. Why have you cut back on your study of the Word of God and your prayer time? Something is happening in here. Now you can go through all the rigmarole of trying to deny it and cover it with fig leaves, but it comes out because when something happens in here, it comes out, negative or positive. If the love of God is in your heart, it comes out. If the spirit of Satan is in the heart, it comes out. Our subject, steps to Christ. Let me boldly say, our theme for the two weeks has been and remains until tomorrow, living in the last days. The greatest problem of living in the last days or the first days is not earthquakes or floods. It is sin. And the most intelligent choice you and I can make in order to live safely in these last days is to live a life of victory over sin day by day, moment by moment, through constant surrender and dependence on Jesus Christ who walked the path you and I walk and conquered in our behalf. Amen. And so tonight, I want to discuss steps to Christ. Because for someone listening to me, something is happening in here. And it's taking you away from God. Perhaps you have never come to God. Something is happening in here that is disturbing you. It's trying to tell you, you ought to come to God. And for the person who has left, you ought to come back. In the book, Great Controversy, page 467, paragraph 3, Ellen White writes these words. The first step in reconciliation to God is the conviction of sin. 
We see this in the publican who stood at the back of the church. He did not feel worthy to stand in the front as the hypocritical Pharisee did. And he said, God, be merciful to me. Finish the words. A sinner. He understood he was a sinner. We're discussing the first step in coming to God, whether for the first time or coming back. I acknowledge I am a sinner. The word sinner is negative, but God loves sinners. Let me say it again. God loves sinners. I did not say God loves sin. God loves sinners. Sinners, more than sinners will ever understand. The Bible says, while we were yet enemies, while we were yet weak, while we were yet without strength, Christ died for us. Not when we become friends. Because you cannot become a friend of God without the help of God. While we were yet enemies, weak, and without strength, Christ died for us. God loves you. You may be a drunkard, God loves you. You may be a whatever, God really loves you. Listen to what the Bible says about God, but let me pray again first. Father, this is serious as it is simple. Speak through me, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, now, if he had three of them, three begotten sons, we could understand. He had one. If someone came to you and said, listen, I'm, I like a shirt. I don't have any shirts. Can you give me a shirt? You're sure you give him a shirt because you have several left. But if you only had one, you'd say, sorry. I just have one shirt. And you keep your shirt. God would take that shirt off and put it on you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Listen to the words again of that verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So we have the son and we have the world. God Loved the world so much, and that includes you. He gave up his son. What does that tell you about God's attitude toward us? God was willing to lose Jesus in order to save us. Which one of you will give up your child for a stranger? I, I, has, I, I, <laughs> I carefully say not one. Listen again to uh, the words of the Bible. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Listen carefully. God had to temporarily turn away from Jesus because he had a choice. I either forsake my son or I forsake them. Or you. Because the gospel is personal. God forsake his son that he might not forsake you. Listen again to the words of God. Luke 22, verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now, the father clearly was not willing to do that because if he had removed that bitter cup from Jesus, he would have had to have given it to the world. I don't think you understand what I'm trying to say. Let me try it this way. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Let's read from verse 3 and verse 4. Of Philippians 2, 3 and 4. Our subject, steps to Christ. You have Philippians 2, 3 and 4. Now, this verse is astonishing, but we must learn to trust a plain, thus saith the Lord. Because we were made in God's image originally, 
we're supposed to behave like God. Now, listen to the Bible. Philippians 2 from verse 3, I may the God of heaven and earth speak through me as I read his word in the name of Jesus, I pray. Let nothing be done through strife of in glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other how? Better than themselves. Okay, let's pause. No rush. What does that require? Lowliness of mind. Let each, you must be more valuable to me than I am to myself. That's Christ-likeness. Let each esteem, let me just digress briefly. If that's the way we thought, there couldn't be crime. There could not be racism. Because you are more important to me than I am to myself. And so I protect you. When we value something, we protect it. And God is saying, we must value others above ourselves. This is no joke. If this is the way God is, and he requires this of us, because it is still God's desire that we live according to his image. Verse 4, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And so 3 and 4 tell us that we are to value others above ourselves. Now listen to verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What mind is that? The mind described in verses 3 and 4. The mind of Jesus was to value others above himself. The mind of the Father was identical. And the Bible tells us that's the mind we must have. Why? Because that's the mind Jesus had. When you think of that now, you begin to understand why God was willing to lose Christ in order to save us. This is the God who tells you, come to me and confess your sin. God is so good that it is he through his spirit that puts upon the heart of a person the urge to confess. Because the carnal mind does not confess. The carnal mind does not repent. If someone listening to me has felt the urge to come to Christ, that urge is a gift from God to you. Act on it. Because the natural condition of a person is not to come to God, to avoid God. But here's what God says he will do. A new heart also will I give you. And a new, a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of, out of your heart, I'll give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk. Amen. There are some people who want to improve themselves before they come to God. You are taking on God's work. You're trying to put God on the unemployment line. If you could improve yourself, there would have been no need for Christ to come. It is God that changes you, but you come to him. Amen. As his spirit puts that conviction on you, and I believe someone listening to me is under that conviction, be it man, woman, boy or girl, that conviction has been with you for a while. It will not stay forever. Act on it. The conviction is God's way of drawing you to him. Amen. But you have to respond. In the book Jeremiah, chapter 3, a beautiful passage to show the simplicity of being saved and the goodness of God. Jeremiah 3, we'll read verses 12 and 13, our subject, Steps to Christ. The, surface, the safest way to live in the last days is to live a life of victory over sin. And that's the safest way to live in any age of the world's history, a life of victory over sin. Here is what God tells backsliding Israel. Go and proclaim these words toward the north. Return the backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will what? I will not cause my anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and will not keep anger forever. So God says, tell those backsliders or those perhaps who have never come to him, come. 
I will not pour out my anger upon you. There are people who are afraid of God. They think God stays up in heaven with a high-powered rifle aiming at them, trying to destroy people. God is trying to save. And so God says, come. Now listen to verse 13, how simple it is. Only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the law of thy God and hast scattered thy ways to the stranger under every green tree. And ye have not obeyed my voice. God said, look, all I want you to do is confess your sin. Come to me and tell me I was wrong. God saves people he doesn't save sin. Let me say it again. God saves, God has one response to sin. That's death. Are you following me? He has one ideal response to sinners. That's life. The tragedy is, if someone persists in living with sin, the person becomes so the certain puts him or herself in the line of fire. What do I mean by that? In my state of Michigan, every fall, there's hunting season. And in other states, I believe. And almost every year, someone is shot accidentally. The person looked like a deer, or a moose, or a black bear. The person got into the line of fire. God hates sin. Hebrews 1 verse 9, the house loved righteousness and hated iniquity. God hates sin and he will destroy sin. But the person who is determined to continue in sin puts himself or herself in the line of fire. And when God fires at sin, that person has to be destroyed. But that's not God's desire. God sent Calvary to get you out of the line of fire. And God says to us tonight, only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God. Amen. How difficult is it to admit? And it is the power of God that allows us to do that. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 24. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. It is God that gives us repentance. At every step, it is God working. But we have to cooperate at every step. And so, through the Spirit of God, God convicts us. You're wrong. And that publican said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. What does he mean by be merciful to me? If someone is asking for mercy, the person is in a helpless condition. And the one to whom the appeal is made has the answer to his or her helplessness. If someone ambushes you in a dark alley at night with a son of shotgun and all you have in your hand is a hymn book. That person can show mercy to you. You can't tell the person, listen, you better leave me. I'm going to show you some mercy. Mm -mm. That person shows mercy to you and may decide not to blow your head off. Now, we come to God. The wages of sin is death and God cannot change that. But he wants to spare you from that. You realize, I cannot save myself. I have tried to give up gambling for 15 years. I've tried to give up smoking for 20 years. I've tried to stop lying and cheating for 25. I've tried to give up laziness for 50. I can't do it. God, help me. God will do for you what you have not been able to do for yourself, perhaps all the days of your life, your awareness of right and wrong. God can do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And the reason I say that, as long as there's a place called Calvary, it means that God must do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And that is, essentially, you cannot save yourself. You can destroy yourself. You cannot save yourself. Conviction of sin, I'm wrong, is the Spirit of God that leads us to say, I am wrong. Recognition that I need help, not just coming to Christ. You speak to any counselor in rehabilitation programs, there must be the acknowledgement, I need help. Whether it's to conquer alcohol, smoking, cigarettes, sex addiction, whatever it is, I need help. That admission must be made. I was invited to a 
uh, uh, well, I went, I worked at an agency many years ago, and young boys who were deemed to be incorrigible and placed in these residential homes by the courts. One was in Alcohol Anonymous or Al-Anon, something for teenagers, and they had to say, I'm an alcoholic, I need help. This confession is required for salvation. I need help. I need to be saved. God tells us in Matthew eleven twenty eight. Go there with me. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Do you have that? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That man or that woman listening to me with a troubled conscience or sitting in this building. Jesus says, come to me. Now that is essential. That's a condition. You must come. Remember I told you, it's the Spirit of God who gently pushes you, but you can resist. I hope you don't. Jesus says, come to me. But Jesus also said, no man can come to me except it were given unto him of my Father. In other words, it is the Father sending the Spirit that moves you to go to Jesus. So you see heaven involved in every step. It is the Spirit of God that convicts you of sin. It is the Spirit of God that leads you to confess. It is the Spirit of God that drives you to Jesus. But you can resist, and I hope you don't. And so Jesus says, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. In the book Faith and Works, page 111, paragraph 1, Ellen White writes, God saves us under a law, not by a law. The law doesn't save. Under a law, she goes on to say, that we must ask if we will receive, seek if we will find, knock if we will have the door open unto us. Now this is clearly expressed in John 3.16. For God so loved the world, that's God's part, that he gave, that's God's part. Whosoever believe him. That's the asking. That's the requesting. That's acknowledging I need help. Whosoever believeth in him. But what does believe in him mean? When in the book of Romans chapter 10 verse 9, Paul wrote that if thou shalt confess with believe in thine heart the Lord Jesus and confess with my mouth that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You confess with your mouth, you believe with your heart, but believe what? The story in Acts chapter 8 helps us. The eunuch, the eunuch said, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Peter said, if thou believest with all thine heart. What does he say? I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. So when the Bible says, whosoever believeth in him, the question, believe what? You believe that Jesus is what you need. He is the Savior. He is the Son of God. He came, he lived, conquered sin, died, raised himself. And it's the only means by which you can be saved. So you see Jesus as an effective Savior. And his sacrifice satisfies the Father. You believe that Jesus can save you. That's what you're believing. And so we read this beautiful statement, Steps to Christ. Page 62, paragraph 2. If you give yourself to him and accept him as your Savior, then... Sinful as your life may have been, for his sake, you're counted righteous. But what does that mean? See, the gospel is so good that sometimes we say it's too good to be true. Listen again. Steps to Christ, page 62, paragraph 2. If you give yourself to him, that's an active step you have to take. Give your life to Christ. And accept him as your savior. The only thing he saves you from is sin. Then sinful as your life may have been. For his sake. You're counted righteous. Let me show you how that happens. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Let me pray again. Father, as I look at a very serious passage of scripture. Be with me God. Help me to make it simple I pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Galatians 5, let's read from verse 19. Our subject, Steps to Christ. Do you have Galatians 5? 
But the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and such like. In other words, on and on and on. Those are the works of the flesh. Now, let's go to verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Now, we have two different characters. Are you with me? We have two different characters, two different natures. The nature that produces adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, and that horrible list. And the nature that produces love, joy, peace, long-suffering. When you come to Christ genuinely, Christ takes that love, joy, peace peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, character, which is his, and gives it to you. Amen. <laughs> You're looking at me as though I need medication. I don't need medication, <laughs> except the love of God and the gospel. Jesus takes that character when you give yourself to him now. And gives it to you. Amen. Then from that point, by staying with him, you learn to live out what he's given to you. Yes, you take a rough man, rough, you know, he's, a, you know, pants halfway down or whatever else, and he's rough, rough, rough. You put him in a suit. <laughs> now he has to learn how to what? Behave like a gentleman wearing a suit. Yeah. Are you with me? You don't crouch on the ground throwing dice in a suit. You don't go to basketball court in a suit. When God gives you the character of Jesus, you've genuinely come to him. Now, and you stay with him, you begin to learn how to behave like someone wearing the suit of the character of Jesus Christ. But you've got to stay in him. You can't do that for yourself. You can't give yourself that character. God gives it to you. This is the gift. It comes down to one word, the righteousness of Christ. Amen. Now, but what happens to the adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lascivious, that list? The Father takes that. Amen. Long time ago, and puts it on Jesus. Amen. He did. <laughs> He's still on him. The probation is not yet closed. He takes that. So we have a great swap. Are you listening to me? God takes your murder. I was doing a crusade in a certain city. A fellow came to me. He said, he, he said I, I killed a man. Can God forgive me? I said, yes. I was in another city somewhere. This lady came to me for counseling. I'm a sex worker. I want to follow Christ. Oh, Yes. There were some sex workers who followed Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus said, the prostitutes get to heaven before you. Christ takes your prostitution. The father. He takes your armed robbery. Are you listening to me? He takes your spousal abuse, whether it's wife on husband, husband on wife. He takes your tax cheating off you. He puts it on Jesus. Here's how I demonstrate that. You go on a farm where there are cows and sheep and horses. You walk into the field. Do you have to be careful where you step? Yeah, because you may step in it. Are you following me? Let's say you step into it. What do you do on the grass? You start to do what? Mm -hmm. You're wiping it off. That stuff you step in is sin. The whole world is a dung field. How can I, where do I wipe it off? The Father says, on him. On him. Wipe it on him. Behold the Lamb of God, which? Take it, wipe it on him. So you can step into my house without contamination. 
and I will deal with him the way I should have dealt with you. In the, the feast of the burnt offering in Leviticus chapter 1, from verses 1 and 3, if his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Verse 4 of Leviticus 1. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Listen again. Verse 3 says, he shall bring it a male without blemish. That's the character of Christ. There was no sin. It shall be accepted for him. In other words, and he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him. Putting your hands meant confession, symbolizes confession. And the Bible tells us in the burnt offering details when the sinner did that, the, 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 the unblemished nature of that lamb, symbolizing the character of Christ, is accepted for him. So he walks away with the unblemished character of Christ, and the lamb has his sins. Some things need to be said over and over again. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5.21. Our subject, steps to Christ. Nothing is easy in the world than coming to Christ, if you're willing. Amen. Easy. A, B, C. Do you have 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21? Listen carefully. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? That's Christ, you know sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now observe the text microscopically. And I want you to tell me who is he and who is him. You have to think. For he hath made him to be sin. Who is he? The Father. Who is him? Jesus. Very good. God bless you. For he, the Father, hath made him, Jesus, to be what? Sin. Why? For us. So we have he, him, sin, and us. Now, here's the Father. Here's sinless Jesus. Here's sinful sinners. God makes Jesus sin. Let me say that differently. I don't mean to say God made Jesus commit a sin. He treated him as if he was a sinner. That we might be made what? The righteousness of God, finish that verse, in him. Because I told you, you must stay in Jesus. Yeah, you're not following me. It's my fault. Let me try again. Okay. I want you to observe the word made. You see the word made in that verse? How many times do you see it? Come on. How many times do you see the word made in 2 Corinthians 5.21? Ah, uh, read the verse completely, microscopically read the verse. How many times do you see the word made if you're reading the King James Version? Hmm? Twice. Listen to the verse. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteous. Now, this is highly significant. Now, let's stay with Jesus. Let me pray again. Father, help me to put it simple, dear God. Please, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen, listen. God hath made him to be sin. You know why God made him to be sin? Because he didn't make himself a sinner. Someone else had to do it. Ah. Hmm. God had to make him like a sinner. He never sinned. Let me say that quickly. Jesus never sinned. But he was treated as one. He was numbered with the transgressors. But since he never sinned, someone else had to do that. Now, that we might be made the righteousness, someone has to make us righteous because we never did it. Do you see the balanced equation? As much as, you see, why do people die? What's, according to the Bible, what's the cause of death? Sin. Did Jesus die? Why? Sin. Nothing he did, but something he took. 
Something he was made. Jesus died because of sin. He took our sins as his, therefore he paid our penalty. Now, we are made his righteousness. That we may have a right to the tree of life and may enter into the gates, into the city. The question is, can you believe that? Let's say someone listening to me is half drunk but still listening. You can smell the alcohol, sleeps under a tree, steals to get by. And he just heard me say, God wants to give him the character of Jesus. And he may say, that's impossible. No, that's not impossible. That's what God has arranged. So come to Jesus. If you come in sincerity, God will take your sins. Put them on Jesus. Take the righteousness of God himself and through Jesus, put it on you. Because you can't make yourself righteous. Someone has to do it. Jesus never sinned. Someone had to treat him like a sinner. It's the father on both sides. There is no need to continue a life of defeat. You can break that habit. You can develop a hatred for the things of the world and a restless, a restless love for the things of God. Amen. You can come to the place where you love to see the Sabbath come and you're sorry to see the sun set the next day. You can come to the place where the Bible means more to you than Sports Illustrated. Amen. Transformation. Amen. That transformation fits you and me for a place in God's coming kingdom. Amen. Am I saying you become a saint overnight? I never said that. I said when you give the life to Christ completely, it cannot be 99.9. .9. You only become a very nice person going to hell. The surrender to God must be complete. And so Jesus told the scribe in Mark 12 from verse 28, and one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, with all thy strength and might and understanding, with everything. This is the surrender required for God to give you the righteousness of Christ. Amen. Because there's no sin in the righteousness of Christ. And there's no righteousness in the sinner. And there's an exchange. And as we stay in Christ, we are protected by that righteousness. As we stay in Christ. Listen to the words of Christ and I will end. Abide in me. Now the word for abide, the Greek word means to stay or to remain. And it's used almost ten times in verse 1 to 10 in the book of uh, John chapter 15. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Except it abide in the vine, that's Christ. No more can ye. Except ye abide in me. That's why I kept saying, stay in him when you come to him. I am the vine, verse 5, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Symbol of hell. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath lived, loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. The word continue is the same Greek word for abide. Amen. Verse 10, if ye abide, stay in me. If ye keep my commandments, 
he shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, Jesus had to abide in the Father. He's not requiring of us what he didn't do. If Jesus had drifted out of the Father, you can finish that story. He had to abide. And he tells us, as I abode in the Father, you stay in me. And so God sends the Holy Spirit to convict me. I am a sinner and I acknowledge I need help. And I come to God. I say, Father, I'm a sinner. I'm helpless. Every sinner is helpless. But for Calvary, I cannot change my life. Save me. You pray that prayer from your heart. What did Peter say when he was drowning? Lord, save me. What did the publican say? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And if that's all you can say tonight, you cannot go wrong. Because Jesus said that man went down to his house, justified, in other words, made right with God. And the publicans back then were considered the scum of the earth. God, be merciful, I need help, to me, a sinner. That man was saved. Peter told the eunuch, if you believe with all your heart, the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He was saved. Tonight, how many of you listening to me right now will say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and he is my Savior. Can I see your right hand? God bless you. For those of you watching online, I hope someone will say, Father, this message has answered my questions. I cannot save myself. I surrender my life to Jesus as far as I can, 100%. Save me, dear God. Come into me and save me if you will say that with all of your heart. God will save you. I'll tell you something else about God and how nice he is. Even if you're unable to say that, you simply say, Lord, I do not know how to surrender my life. Take it. Did you hear me? You can say to God, Father, I'm not sure how to surrender my life. You come and take it. By take it, you don't mean to ask him to kill you. Come and take control of my life. You do it and God will do it. Because he's not willing that any should perish. Let me close by telling you what you know but perhaps have forgotten. This world is coming to an end. <laughs> it's not often preached. This world is coming to an end. Your degrees are good, they won't save you. They'll burn. The only thing that will escape the fiery end of the world is the character that Christ gives to us. It's the thing that receives the least attention. Jesus Christ is coming back. Not to save people. When probation closes, that's done. Right now, he's a priest. You can pray to him. When he comes back, according to Revelation 14, 14, he's wearing a crown, not a mitre. The priest wore a mitre. A conquering king wore a crown. He has in his hand a sickle, not a, a censer. The sickle is to reap. I say again, as your brother in Christ, someone who needs Jesus as much as you do, this world is coming to an end. Give your life to Jesus. Just say with me, Father, I need help. I am a sinner. I need Christ. Forgive me and come into my life right now as I surrender completely to you. You pray that prayer and God will do what he wants to do so much. He will save you. If you drop dead one second after that prayer, you will be safe in God's kingdom. Some of you listening to me need to make a decision to be baptized. One of the tricks the devil uses is to tell you, you need to know everything first. That's not true. You don't need to know everything. You know enough that God wants you to obey him. He wants you to follow him. He wants you to give up that life of sin. And you're willing to do that. When I say obey him, all ten commandments, including the fourth, 
the seventh day Sabbath. If you know that and you're willing to follow Christ, make a decision to be baptized. I hope you'll stay online for interaction during the Zoom section, which will be in a few minutes. But for now, let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for steps to Christ. We thank you, dear God, that you're so over-eager to save that we do not understand. You have paid the ultimate price, and someone who pays such a price surely wants the thing for which he paid the price. That's us. Dear God, I present to you anyone listening who needs to surrender to your son. Surrender to you. Let your spirit, Father, work over time to bring the person to the point of surrender because the best time for that is now, not tomorrow. Father, please, if you're serious about not willing that any should perish, do everything in your limitless power to bring that man, that woman, to surrender. May the word spoken tonight remain in the minds of those who heard and do a work of transformation, winning some and strengthening others. And as we enter into the Zoom, bless that section of the program also, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I stay here, Pastor? Okay. We will be going into Zoom in a minute as our experts set us up. We thank mm -hmm. God for technology. The Bible says yes, knowledge shall be increased, and that knowledge is mainly about Daniel Revelation, but also includes other forms of knowledge like this. Yes, so I think we're ready. Yes, Pastor. Can you hear me and yes, see? Yes, yes, we can. We can. Perfect. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, we are excited to get started. We do have a few participants uh, who have their questions. Mm -hmm. So uh, for those on Zoom and for those watching online, um, we do have a few, um, a few uh, favors. We got three of them here in order, to, in order for this to work. Uh, number one, for those on Zoom, please raise your hand and wait to be called on. Uh, when you are called on, you will be asked to unmute yourself. Then you will turn on your camera and you will ask your question. Uh, if, uh, you're, if you're having troubles with uh, your sound um, or your speakers, you can also type your question on the chat box mm -hmm. and your question will be shared uh, to Pastor Randy Skeet uh, through me as he can hear me in the sanctuary. Uh, make sure that your sound is clear. Make sure that no others are on the same Zoom uh, in the same room. So we can go ahead and get started in the sanctuary, Pastor uh, Skeet. If you can take any questions in the sanctuary and I will collect the questions here or for those okay. who have questions on Zoom, raise your hand. All right, before I take questions, let's ask for wisdom, Father in heaven, James 1 chapter 5, verse chapter 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. First, Father, I certainly lack it, and I ask you for wisdom that I may answer your people according to your will for them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Any questions from those live before we go to Zoom? Any questions from those right here in the building, I should say, because we're live in the building and on Zoom. Any questions? Well, not yet. Not yet from the building. Do we have any on Zoom? Okay. They can also hear you as well. So any oh, questions okay. on Zoom? Do we have any questions here on Zoom? Is that a hand I see going up? I see a hand, my good brother. Is a hand live? Where? Oh, yes, over here. Can I take this question? All right. Yes, my dear sister. Um, can you explain the time delay that takes place right now? Uh huh. Yes. What's happening in heaven now? In a, uh, <laughs> that's one of the biggest uh, questions you can ask. Is the very foundation of the Adventist Church. It is called Christ is interceding on our behalf. He's our representative, our high priest before the Father. It doesn't mean the Father is hostile, but because Christ took human form, he understood what we went through, he, was con he conquered, he rose, he now applies the merits of his victorious life 
to us when we come to him in faith and surrender. According to Revelation 3 verse 5, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angel. Christ speaks for us before the father. That's what he's doing. He represents us and he's blotting out our sins as we have surrendered to him. When this act of removing the blotting out is done, that's when probation closes and he comes back. And that's, again, a big subject I'm trying to give you in a couple of minutes. But Christ is now our intercessor, our high priest who makes intercession for us. That's why it's important to be one with Christ. And anyone who is one with Christ is fine with the Father. Anyone for whom Christ speaks, the Father accepts, because the Father also loves us. But Christ's work right now is intercessor and also the work of cleansing the sanctuaries going on, because our sins must never come back to haunt us. The devil must never be able to bring them back. So when this examination goes on in our lives, our records, Christ compares our profession with our practice. You said, you're my child, let me look at your life. This is part of what is going on. But the life that's given to Christ, that person is safe. It's not a terrifying event. If your life is in the hands of Christ, you have nothing to worry about because the judgment will be in your favor. Amen. Yes, Pastor. Why do I think so many men? Well, one is cultural. Men are considered the tough, you know, the, the big, strong men. And church is sometimes seen, uh, you know, surrender to Jesus is sometimes seen as an act of weakness. That's why in the United States, most church attendance is about 70 to 80% women, not men. But I'll say something else. Men are more heavily attacked in this area than are women. You see, God arranged for men to be in charge. When I say that, men to be leaders, I should say, because the leader is a servant. Adam was the leader in his home. The priests were the leaders. God chose men to be the leaders of their family, society, the church. God's arrangement always works best. When men take the lead, the benefit of the family is almost incalculable. The devil knows that. Most men in prison came out of homes with no fathers especially the black men. They came out of homes with no fathers. About almost 80, 85% of them did not have a father figure in the home. I was talking to the pastor yesterday or the day before. I read this study a few years ago. It was a study done among Christians. If the very first person in a family to accept Christ is a child, there's a 14% chance the whole family will follow. If the very first person in a family to accept Christ is the mother, there's a 23% chance the whole family will follow. You can almost finish what I'm about to say. If the very first person in a family to accept Christ is the father, there's a 96% chance the whole family will follow. Because that's God's arrangement, and his arrangement always worked best. And the only reason why it isn't 100%, we're living in a world of sin. The devil knows that. He knows the devil has gone after men. Most inmates are men. In any country, most inmates are men. And Satan has done a tremendous job in removing men from their positions of responsibility in the church and in the home. And the result is a deterioration of society at every level. Many, many years ago, I used to listen to a program called The World Tomorrow, a fellow called Herbert W. Armstrong. And some of you may be old enough to remember him. He died in 86. He had this principle to solve the problems in society. Put daddy back at the head of the home. The devil has targeted men, and of course men cooperate. In our society, mother, not motherhood, um, stay-at-home moms are considered a career woman is are you following me? In the eyes of God, a stay-at-home mother is. The world sees the opposite. Same with men. The toughest man who ever lived was Jesus. But compare him to modern tough men, you have two different people altogether. 
the devil has targeted men with great success. The Bible says, you smite the shepherd, you scatter the sheep. And Satan has attacked the shepherds, and that's men. And as young boys observe, they grow up the same way. That's the question number two. Do it immediately. Do it immediately. Even if you're on the fence, you say, Lord, come into my life and bring me to the point of total surrender. Do it immediately. You don't have to be perfect in your thinking. All you need to say is, Lord, I need help. Come, take my life, save me. Ask God to save you. It's not complicated. You're on the fence, Father, I'm on the fence. Save me so I fall on the right side. Because if you don't, Satan will push you to the wrong side. Ask God to save you. God will save you whether you're on the, right, on the fence or you're off the fence. He wants to save you. You ask him, they, God, save me. And God will save you. But ask him to do that day by day so you stay saved. There's being saved and there's staying saved. That's why Christ says, abide in me, remain, stay, continue. Yes, my dear brother. Uh, Pastor Randy, we have one question on the floor. Can you hear yes. us, Brother Zambrano? If, if if you can please repeat the questions on. Oh the floor. yes, 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 I will. Okay. Yes, my okay. brother. What's the question? Um, my question is, since, uh, since everything we have black and white people. Uh huh. Why do we have black and white black and white people? Okay. The question is, the heaven to which we're going, everyone's going black, white, pink, blue, whatever. Why do we have black and white conferences in the United States? Um, that grew out of the racial condition of the United States back in the 30s and 20s and going back. And Ellen White counseled the brethren, until the conditions change, it may be better to worship separately. And that was good counsel. Let me say it again, that was good counsel. And so the first black conference, which is my conference, Lake Region Conference, was formed, I think, in 1944, and then several followed. We have nine. But she said, until a better way is found. So the original purpose for establishing black conferences was not an expression of racism. It was to find a way to do God's work in a hostile environment. But when God is ready, he'll remove that. Because we must practice heavenly behavior. When we must practice heaven society on this earth before we get over there. But black conferences were not established to express racism. It was a form of how can we advance God's work if we do it with, the, with our own people, given the conditions of the time. All right, next question. Do we have any online questions? I don't see my brother. Oh, do we have any from the Zoom? Yes, we do. The first one in line is Brother Edwin Saram. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and stuff and ask your question, sir. Uh, hello, Pastor. Thank you so much for the sermon. I have a question, yes. uh, which is uh, about the, the sinful of listening to secular music. Uh -huh. I am not sure whether listening to secular music is, is, is sin, and if it's sin, how do we pull away from it? Because it is something that is drawing us back every now and then. Thank you. The Bible says in first, let me pray again, Father, continue to speak through me that I may answer intelligently. When I say intelligently, I mean biblically. In Jesus' name, amen. When Nebuchadnezzar wanted the three boys to bow, he gave them a second chance. He said in Daniel 3.15, now if he be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. He wanted music to affect their emotion and their response, which means music can powerfully affect behavior. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, whether, the, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do or play music or listen to music, do all to the glory of God. My brother, there is no exception to that. So you, the individual, must ask himself or herself, is this true? Is this honest? Is this pure? Is this of good report? You see, does this bless me spiritually? In some cultures, someone may say yes. 
but when it comes to heaven, it's not individual culture. It is a conviction of the Spirit of God. Someone who grew up in Nashville will say, well, country music is good music. The Spirit may say no. Someone who grows up in, uh, grew up in New Orleans may decide, well, jazz is good spiritual music. The Spirit of God may say no. Someone who grew up in the West Indies may say, Calypso is good music to glorify God. The Spirit may say no, because the Spirit has one culture, the culture of heaven. And so when it comes to music, the question is, does this glorify God? Are the words biblical? Do they teach a message that's sound? And what's the reaction on me physically? Because music affects you at the level of the cell. Let me place this for your consideration. Almost every rap concert, fights break out. Are you with me? Never heard of a fight at a classical concert. <laughs> Are you following me? No, I'm not saying, all I'm saying is fights break out, riots break out at rock concerts and rap concerts. And these, you don't hear of a fight at a gospel concert or a classical concert. I'm just saying that for us to think. Music has a tremendous effect on the emotions. That's why every movie has a musical uh, soundtrack. Because it affects the emotions and most of our decisions are made emotionally. Even major decisions are made emotionally. So you have to ask God and God will guide you. Psalm 32 verse 8 I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. How does this music draw me closer to God? Because the devil has his, and it sounds just like God's. Thank you, my good brother, for that question. God bless you. Another question? Yes, yes we have someone. Do we have one in the sanctuary? Yes, we do. Right over oh. here. Yes, my good sister. Um, happy Sabbath. I believe that Saturday is the day of worship, is the day of Sabbath. Mm -hmm. But I have not been able to explain to some people who have been asking me, that, how do you come about Saturday? Why not Thursday? Why not Friday? Please, I need my explanations, please. Would you give me that question again? I know, and uh -huh. I believe that Saturday is the day of Sabbath. Saturday is what? It's the day of Sabbath. It's God's Sabbath, yes. Yes, okay. The, the seventh day. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, but I've not been able to explain to people that. Because people have been asking me, why do I have to go to church on Saturday? Why not Friday? Okay, why not all right. Thursday? Okay, I got it. Yes, the sir. question is, why go to church on the seventh day Sabbath and not on Tuesday or Wednesday because any day is a day? That's not true. If any day were a day, God would not say, this is my day. The Sabbath was chosen because of a historical act. God rested on a particular day. Let me explain about the Sabbath. The reason why the Sabbath was blessed is because God rested on that day. Are you following me? He did not rest on the first or the fifth or the second. In order to change the Sabbath, you must go back and rewrite history. Listen to the fourth commandment. Genesis 20 from verse uh, 10. In it, Thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, or for this reason, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. The reason the Sabbath is the seventh is that God rested on that day. Listen to Sabbath language even before the Ten Commandments were given on Sinai. Genesis 2, 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Before sin entered the world, we we're introduced to the Sabbath. And I want you to see something. How God wants to hammer. Even before sin, his day is the seventh. Listen again to Genesis 2, 2 and 3. Five times God mentions the seventh day. If you read the King James Version, and on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. What's the pronoun? It stands in place of a noun. Because that in it 
he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Five times we're told in those two little verses. The holy day is the seventh day. The reason why we worship on the seventh day, my sister, and for all listening, that's the day on which God rested. He did not rest on Sunday. He did not rest on Tuesday or Wednesday or Friday. He rested on the seventh. The rest of God is the reason for the blessing. of. I'll tell you something else. It was only after God rested that he blessed the day. So L.O.I. tells us, he rested, blessed it, then gave it to us as a Sabbath. Let me say it again. He rested first. When the rest was over, he blessed the day. Which means, when he blessed the seventh day, it was Sunday. You missed what I just said. You missed what I just said. My fault. He rested all of the seventh day. Are you with me? When that was done, the seventh day was over... Then he blessed it. When the seventh day is over, what's the next day? Sunday. Sunday. So God was standing on Sunday when he blessed the seventh day. God chose, and he also calls it my day. If it's his day, we have to respect what's his. The Bible says over and over, my day, my day, my day. To change it to another day, you have to show from the Bible that God rested on another day. Thank you. Someone else. Is anything online, my brother? We have yes. someone online? Okay, let's take online. Yes, here's your next question. This is from a seven-year-old. He's the member named Ade. A seven-year-old? Yes. Oh, that's he nice. is at, he's asking, how can God love us so much uh -huh. when we are just made from dust? Okay. Good question from that little prophet. Okay, how can God love us so much we're made from dust? God is love. Are you following me? That's the way God is. Now, let me ask that little seven-year-old boy. Do you disobey your parents sometimes? The answer is yes. Do they still love you? Yes. Do you make them angry sometimes? Yes. Do they still love you? Yes. Why? Because you belong to them. You came from them. God made us. We're his, and so he loves, and he made us in his image, and so he loves us. He, didn't, he doesn't love us because we were made. He loves us because that's the way God is. He just loves. And the fact you're made of dirt does not change the, the, the love of God. You're made of dirt, but God treats you like gold. Let me, uh, should I tell you this? All right. If you read Genesis 2 from verse 10, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into two heads. The name of the first was Pison, that is it, which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land was good. There's Delium and the onyx stone. We have gold, Delium, onyx stone. There must have been other precious stones. Now the dry land was made on day three. Which means, when God came to make Adam, there was gold available. Are you listening to me? But he chose dirt. <laughs> because he had to show the universe what he can do with dirt. Are you following me? I can take dirt and elevate dirt above gold. Because that dirt was made in my image. The gold wasn't. Are you following me? And so my little brother, God loves you because he made you in his image. And he wants you to live according to his image. And God bless you. I'm very glad you asked that question. God bless that little boy. Someone Amen. else? Any yes, other we have here on Where? Zoom. Uh, oh, we have someone on Zoom. LG. We'll come to you. Who's yes, on Zoom? Zoom user LG Stylo 6 is next. Please unmute yourself and state your question. Good night. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Yes, I'm asking the question for someone who's been, grew up in the message as a Sabbath keeper, Seventh-day mm -hmm. Adventist for... Mm -hmm. 56 years okay. and they continue to behave in a way that is not spiritual right yet they they do spiritual things mm -hmm. they speak they as they love jesus but they continue to do their behavior mm -hmm. it has been the same way what's really going on 
such what's going on is that the person is not fully converted the person is uh, not fully converted a fully converted person behaves like jesus the person makes mistake but that kind of life you describe cannot describe the life of a fully converted and i said the true conversion is very rare in the church that's why there's so many perplexities in the church it's not very common that person i'm not saying the person doesn't think that he or she is sincere the person is not fully converted but god is very patient and long suffering and he's trying to arrange circumstances to bring that person to the place of total surrender and full conversion because god deals with us individually we have different experiences Someone who's been drinking for 60 years, the person comes to Christ genuinely, he still have a struggle. And so, without judging that person, yes, that lifestyle does not suggest total conversion or surrender, but God deals with us individually, and the person may somewhere down the line finally come to the place of total surrender to God. But the lifestyle you described suggests the person is not fully converted. And that's widespread in the church. The tares grow with the wheat. Remember, Paul was not converted. Jesus converted him. Nebuchadnezzar was converted. And he was a bloodthirsty man. So yes, it might have been 56 years, but at some point, the person will finally get it. Whenever he or she gets it, God will be happy. But remember, the sooner you get it, the better. Someone else. Yes, we have someone in the back. We have someone in the church, my dear brother. Yes, sister. So uh, one of the question is a continuation to the question that she asked. If um, I claim that Sunday is my Sabbath, mm -hmm. how would you explain that to me? Very simple. You can't have a Sabbath. The Sabbath belongs to God. Are you with me? It belongs to God. Verily my Sabbath you shall keep. Exodus 31 verse 13. You cannot have a Sabbath. You can recognize God's Sabbath. The Sabbath of God is the seventh day. You choose to obey it or not, but you cannot have your Sabbath. The Sabbath is the day on which God rested and blessed. That's why it is. So I understand what you mean, but you cannot technically have a Sabbath. It belongs to God. You can have the six days. Those are for us. The Sabbath belongs to God. Let me rephrase it. Okay, all right. So the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. Yes. Uh, and the calendar was changed, right, by human beings. So Who said what that? if, what Who said, if? Who said that? <laughs> okay, what if I claim that the seventh day of the Lord is uh -huh. on a Monday and not on a Saturday? All right. Would I be wrong? Yes, you'd be very wrong. The calendar was changed, yes, but the order of the days was never changed. Are you following me? Okay. It has always been Sunday to Saturday. That has never changed. Now, let's be honest with God. When is Easter celebrated? On everywhere around the world, Easter is celebrated on a Sunday. You check your calendar at home, you'll never see Easter on a Monday. Why? Because the Christian world knows Jesus rose on the first day. Easter celebrates the resurrection of Jesus. So a Christian telling me Sunday is my Sabbath is not thinking. The seventh day is the Sabbath, the first day is the day of Easter, which is a Sunday. Amen. Okay, my next question is, I know that, um, <laughs> so... We're told that in this age and in this era, 95%, mm -hmm. uh, no, if the, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church, 95% mm -hmm. of the church members would not realize that. Why is it? Well, I don't have a statistical figure to give you, but I do know Jesus said the road to perdition, many go, the road to salvation, very few go. So that's consistent with what you just said. We will not be aware because our eyes are not enlightened by constant study of the word of God. When Christ came the first time, you know who knew he was coming? The three wise men. The entire Jewish nation, as far as we know, didn't know. And they were supposed to know to tell the world he's coming. They didn't know. Why? They didn't study. As they should, in the right perspective, they were looking for a military commander to overthrow the Romans. Not someone born in a manger with cows and horses and sheep. They didn't know. 
When Christ comes a second time, why he will come as a thief in the night? Because those of us who need to spread the message, perhaps we don't. And so my sister, when we're not educated in the word of God, he will come as a thief. Mm -hmm. So the Holy Spirit may be withdrawn, and most of us don't know because we're not educated in God's word and the counsel of God's servant, Ellen White. Yes, Pastor. Okay, all right. Okay, all right. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, all right, Pastor. All right, okay. Pastor Zambrano, do you have one for us online? We have next in line Zoom user Robert Jackson. Uh, he will say his question. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Robert Jackson. Brother Robert Jackson. Thank you, Pastor Skeet. You're welcome. Good seeing you. Uh, I'm here with my wife from New Jersey. Oh, Jersey. Okay. Uh, part of the Allegheny East Conference. Mm -hmm. uh, my question to you uh, is the difference between sins covered and sins blotted out mm -hmm. and what that means uh, for us and for the saints of God in the future. What is the difference right. between okay. sins that, covered and sins blotted out? That's a heavy out? question. If you go back to the sanctuary, because his way is in the sanctuary, sins, when uh, Leviticus 1 verse 4, and he shall put his hand upon the head of the offering, and it shall be accepted to him to make atonement for him. When he does that, he transfers his sins to the animal, but then the sin has to be applied either to the altar or to the veil on the inside, separating the holy from the most holy. Sins were placed in the sanctuary or some area of the sanctuary, which means that they still existed. There was still an ongoing record of sins. Sins forgiven, there's still a record. Now, what Christ is doing is blotting that out from the lives of those who truly given themselves to him. He is blotting out that record of sin. A confessing still existed. It didn't count against the sinner, but it still existed now. You commit a crime, there's a criminal record, but you're out of jail, you're running around, you're working, you're free now, but there's a record. God wants to wipe that out. So sins blotted out can never be brought back against you. But when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. The righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered. In other words, and the same goes for the wicked man. Sins can come back if they're not blotted out. And so a forgiven sin is one that's removed from your life, but it is stored somewhere. Blotting out means it is nowhere in existence anymore. That's what Christ is doing. So the devil can never bring back sins because he is an accuser. When that work of blotting out is done, that's when Jesus... But he can only blot out what has been confessed. Are you following me? We have to confess our sins, send them up, so Christ can blot them out. That's a very heavy question. God bless you, my good brother Jackson. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you and the family. Amen. All right. Anyone else? That was a very important question. Very, very important. I hope you'll study that. Pastor, mm -hmm. can, yes. can we take one more pastor? So, yes, my pastor. Here we go. Uh, from uh, Zoom user iPhone, Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, talks about 144,000. Mm -hmm. Who are the... Or how can you know them? The 144,000 are described in Revelation 14:5, and in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. They pop up in Revelation 7, Revelation 14. They have the character of God, God's name written in their forehead, meaning the character of God. They are without fault. They represent those who at the end of time would have come to the place of total victory, Surrender to Christ and the character of Christ fully represented in them so he can come and claim them as his own. Uh, Christ Object Lessons, page 69, paragraph 1. Now, some in the church believe the number is symbolic. Some believe it's literal. So I'm not giving one way or the other. What I'm saying is what's important is the character of the 144,000. They are without fault before the throne of God. In their mouth was found no guile, which is how Christ is described in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, 22. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. We will come to the place, those of us who are in that number, where we reflect the character of Jesus that he may come. You see, God must be able to say to the universe, 
Here, at last, is an entire group of people who kept my law, give me the word, perfectly. Because Satan's original charge against God was, his law is unfair and cannot be kept. He, he tried to demonstrate that in the lives of Adam and Eve by causing them to sin. See, your law cannot be kept. Jesus came and he kept it. But the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Jesus is only one witness. Are you with me? God needs another witness, and that is the church. Before Christ comes, the church must come to the place where we reflect his character through faithful obedience. Then God's, Satan's charge would have been finally overthrown, and God vindicated, and he can come. Some believe the number is literal, some symbolic. What I want to leave with you is the character of the members of that group. In their mouth was found no guile. They are without fault before the throne of God. Before the throne of God, they may be faulty in the eyes of people. They are without fault before the throne of God. If you look at Daniel, when uh, Darius went to the, the lion's den, Oh, Daniel, did God save you? He said, King, live forever. My God has sent his angel and have shut the lion's mouth that they have, done, they have not hurt me. Because before thee, before thee, meaning the king, I have done no hurt. And also before God, Innocence was found in me. I'm innocent before God and man. The 144,000 will be in that condition. Amen. Let's have another question. I'm on, ah, we have one in the building. I don't know who, uh, can I see the person? All right, yes, my dear brother. Yeah, What's the good question? Good night, everybody. Hmm? I'm just saying good night. Everybody. Oh, yes, good evening, good evening. Yeah, um, I'm having a problem with uh, while you were preaching to understand um, what it means to be saved mm -hmm. because I listened to a pastor many years ago mm -hmm. and um, I tried it and I realized that it wasn't true mm -hmm. that I cannot save myself right, no you can't um, well if I cannot save myself mm -hmm. and then it's only Jesus mm -hmm. then after I get saved why did I leave the church, you know, if Jesus already saved me? But you can leave him. You see, the question is, if I'm saved, why do I leave the church if I'm saved? Jesus chose 12 disciples, my brother. He chose them himself. John chapter 6, verse 70, have I not chosen you 12? One of you is a devil. Now, one decided to go his own way. His name was Judas. Jesus, in praying to the Father, said in John 17, 12, while I was with them in the world, let me pray again. Father, continue to be with me, please, as I answer these very intelligent questions. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. John 17, verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou givest me, I have kept. None of them is lost, but the son of perdition. But this was the same disciple to whom Jesus gave power to cast out demons in Mark chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. Judas chose to leave. A saved person can give up that salvation. In 2 Thess 2 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, Paul says, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Demas used to work with Paul. He was a follower. He decided to leave. It doesn't happen overnight. Perhaps he started, he stopped praying, whatever. These things happen over a period of time. And so, my brother, yes, you can be fully saved and decide not to continue. Mm -hmm. You can decide that. But it's never God's fault. It's because at some point, you slacked up in praying, you slacked up in Bible study, you placed yourself on Satan's ground, and the thing occurred. And you find yourself no longer in love with God. But a genuinely saved person can leave God. That's why there's freedom in God. You can't leave the devil. Someone has to get you out. You can just leave God. And you ask, what are you saved from? You're saved from sin. Let me explain what I mean by that. Sin is a power. It's all not just an act. It's a power that you and I cannot resist in our own strength. That's what the Bible says. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? The answer is no. So salvation is God. Is salvation from that 
penalty, that power of sin, also from the penalty attached to it. And of course, also from the presence of sin. But initially, from the penalty and the power of sin. Sin is a power that a sinner cannot resist in his own power. You may not kill anyone, you may not curse, but you have pride. You see, we sin up here. A sinner must sin. A converted person comes to the place where he doesn't have to anymore. Okay. So we're saved from the power of sin, yes? Yes, um, I, I understand that, but I, what I'm trying to say is the way we promote it as Christians. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you say, uh, remember, everybody is not on the same level of understanding. That's true. That's so true. At that time, what I, when I, I really wanted to give my life to Christ, all I was thinking about is once I come to him, then I will be saved. I wasn't thinking. It's just like marriage, you know. You think the first time, that day when you get married, mm -hmm. it's going to be like that. Right, all right, the time, right. right. Uh -huh. I realized that it was not true with Christianity, mm -hmm. you know. Once you get Save, then the work just begun. Yes. Then every day you have to try to save yourself. Well, you know, you, if you don't, um, it's, it's every decision. Like, G I was expecting that Jesus would come and help me, literally. But I found out that when I had to make decisions not to sin, that was me, not Jesus. What, so wait, I, okay, let me, let me deal with that. Let me deal with that. The power, my brother, is right here. This is the power. That works in a person. This, you know, Jesus told the disciples in John 15, 3, Now you clean through the word. Psalm 119, verse 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119, verse 9, How can a young man cleanse his life? By obeying God's word. Ephesians 5, 26, That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And how does that happen? By the washing of water by the word. What did Jesus tell the Father? Sanctify them through thy truth. Sanctification is a cleansing. And so you, you have to make a decision to do what's right. The power to carry it out is the power of Christ. Let me also say this. I don't need Christ to decide I won't kill someone. You understand? I don't need Christ to decide I'm not robbing a bank. There are a lot of good actions we can do without God. The, the fundamental thing we cannot change is our nature. We cannot change that. God alone can do that. There, there are a lot of atheists. I believe most atheists are law-abiding people. They don't go to jail. They, you know, they live good lives. They don't break into their neighbor's houses. They're nice people, in quotation marks, but they're not saved. Because only God can save you from the condemnation of sin and that power that without help you can't resist. So you decide. You know, the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 7, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. You have to resist, but the submission is absolutely essential. Peter, writing in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 12, he says, Fight the good fight of faith. But the weapon is the word of God. In uh, Revelation 12, verse 26, but that which thou hast, hold fast. Hold it. And so there's something you and I do, but the power to do it successfully is the power of God through the word. Amen. Mm. This word created the universe. Are you with me? And God said, and God said, but listen to Ellen White. Um, Christ Object Lessons, page 100, paragraph 1. The scriptures are the primary agency in the transformation of character. Jesus prayed, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Then she goes on to say, if studied and obeyed. The word of God works in the heart. Subduing, what does that mean? Subdue, control. Every unholy attribute. Gambling, smoking, pornography, the word of God studied and obeyed works in the heart, subduing every unholy attribute. And so Jesus told Satan and he told us, man shall not live by bread alone, finish it for me, but by every word. Can you make a mistake? Yes, but mistakes will not characterize your life. Thank you, my brother. When you come to Christ, you have declared war on the devil. You see, coming to Christ is a declaration of war, and the devil will not let you go without a fight. 
But you stay in Christ and you'll conquer. Mm -hmm. Because you're a baby, you're learning. Making a mistake doesn't mean you're not converted. You're learning. Someone else. We do have a oh. uh, online question Pastor, right. a YouTube, uh, from a YouTube uh, viewer. Should I leave my wife if she believes the Sabbath is on Sunday? What's the person's name? Or oh, the person wants to remain unnamed. Uh, well, that's okay. Uh, you, that's all right. Go ahead. Should go ahead. I leave my wife if what? She believes the Sabbath is on Sunday. Oh, no, 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 no. You can't do that. No. What God have joined together, let not man put asunder. You pray for your wife. You give her Bible studies. But you pray most. You pray, let her hear you pray for her. And you pray quietly because God loves your wife. And wants her saved. You don't leave her because she eats meat. No, 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 no. Or believe Sunday is the Sabbath. Mm -mm. She's your wife. Let her see your faithful life to God. And that will bring her. Mm -hmm. That's the counsel Peter gives women in 1 Peter 3, verse 1 to 3. Women married to unsaved men. He says, your life, your upright life, plus respect for that man as your husband, that will bring him to God. So if your wife doesn't keep the seven-day Sabbath, you love her. Your love at marriage is unconditional, like the love of God. That love for her and your faithfulness to God will come by my... Um, my mother-in-law, she's resting in her grave, God bless her. My father-in-law became an Adventist first. And my mother-in-law was not the happiest person alive. She's a, she was a sweet child of God, don't misunderstand me. But she had not yet seen the truth. And she was angry. And went to the Bible to find reasons why she, he, she shouldn't keep the Sabbath. And she studied herself right into the church. <laughs> She went to the Bible to find reasons and got baptized. <laughs> so you don't leave the spouse. You offer yourself to God as an instrument of evangelism. Yes. All right, Pastor Zambrano, anybody else? Yes, and Pastor, remember, you tell me when Okay, to let's stop. take two or three more and then uh, we'll close. Okay. Here's another YouTube question. A yes. uh, question from Trinidad. Trinidad. My name is mm. Shana. My name and is what? Shana. Shana. All can right. an SDA work in the military? And if yes, can we work on the Sabbath? Please, I need an answer. Please. All right, let me pray again. Father in heaven, we're dealing with the most important commandment of the ten, the Sabbath. Tell me precisely what to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me read the text of the fourth commandment. Exodus 28 to 11. Now you listen to the words carefully. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work but the seventh day is the sabbath of the lord thy god in it thou shalt not do any work thou nor thy son nor thy daughter thy man servant nor thy maid servant nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates for in six days the lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that in them is and rested the seventh day wherefore the lord blessed the sabbath day and hallowed it everything god had to do he did in six he tells us follow that pattern now jesus says it is lawful to do good on the sabbath he did not say it is lawful to work. Ella White gives us counsel in medical ministry, page 216, paragraph 2. When a doctor or nurse has to go into the hospital on Sabbath, the money given must be given to the church. Because you're not supposed to work. Are you with me? That amen is too weak. Are you with me? <laughs> you're not supposed to work. But you can do good. And so, yes, Adventists are in the military. As far back as the 1800s, Adventists had a position of non-combatant status. You can enter the military, but the Bible says thou shalt not kill. So you're, you're a medic or you're a chaplain or something, but you must represent your faith. I'll also give you this caution. Avoid work environments where your relationship with God is brought under threat. Are you following me? Yes. Avoid work environments where your spiritual life will be under constant threat. And that's all I'll say. 
Ella White writes, avoid putting your children in educations where the Sabbath will be compromised. So that person, tell that person, if possible, avoid the military. If possible. Because you don't run your own life in the military. Someone else. Pa oh, yes. Pastor Brano, we have someone in the building. Yes, sister. Hmm? My question is, why not go and do that good on the Sabbath day? Go still and the church will not take the money. Because if that money is paid to church, we must work on the Sabbath day. No, let me, let me explain. Read Medical Ministry, page 216, paragraph 2. That chapter deals with the, 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 the sanctuary, the, the, uh, the people who work in the, in the, the, the health sanctuary. LOI says the doctor and the nurse must let the patients know they are Sabbath keepers. People are not to be allowed to suffer on Sabbath. She says when they go, they go and do only that which is necessary to relieve suffering. Anything else can be left for another day. That's what she specifically writes. But if they're still paid for that, give the money to the church. So when Jesus healed on Sabbath, that was medical work. But it was not work. It was doing good. Mm-hmm. If you do what? If I say where you're going to walk in, you're not paying me on Sabbath day, I'm coming to give a charitable Yes. Precisely. She's coming to give a charitable work where she normally works. Yes. In your mind, you see, it's, a, a, it's volunteer work. Yes. In your mind. It's charitable work. Yes. If they put the money on you, give it to the church. And you will never lose. The Sabbath cannot be negotiated. If you negotiate the Sabbath, you have to negotiate the adultery one. You cannot negotiate God's law. The reason why we're not blessed is because we, we, we negotiate disobedience and obedience. You know, you get double pay on Saturday, so you say, well, I'm a nurse, let me go work. No, 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 no. Christ's object lessons, page 316, paragraph 2, every act is judged by the motive. Mm-hmm. That prompts it. Every act is judged by the motives that prompt it. Let me tell you something. Ellen White writes in a Patriarchs and Prophets, page 479, paragraph 2. Listen carefully. God shut Moses out of Canaan to teach a lesson that must never be forgotten, that he requires exact obedience. And until we practice exact obedience, we will never be witness to the full blessings of God. Pastor Zambrano, is there anyone online with a question? Yes. There yes, is? There yes, is. Pastor. Okay, there is one on YouTube. YouTube, uh, okay. Pastor, What's the question? Edward George is Edward asking, George. Mm -hmm. Dear Pastor, the title of tonight's message was Steps to Christ. Mm -hmm. Can you go a bit deeper and explain what Christ was really saying when he told Peter, come? When he told Peter, come where? He must be referring yeah. to walking on the water. Hmm. In Matthew chapter 14, when God, Peter said in verse 29, Lord, if it be thou bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. Peter made a request to Christ. Christ, under the direction of the Father, told Peter, come. Now, it was, a, it was an opportunity to test Peter, which was a lesson for the other disciples. When Christ said, come, and Peter stepped out, he began to walk. Then he took his eyes off to Christ, and he began to sing. Christ told him to come. All the reasons why, we're not sure. But Christ told him, come. And he did that at the direction of the Father because Jesus said, I only say what the Father tells me to say. Amen. John 7, John 8, John 10, John 12, John 14. I only say what the Father tells me to say. So when Peter said, can I come? Jesus said, come. 
And in that experience, the disciples got an opportunity of faith and lack of faith, uh, an, uh, 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 an example of faith and lack. When he walked, it was by faith. When he sank, it was lack of faith. They also saw that they walked, that Peter walked the same way Christ was walking. Did you understand what I just said? Peter and Christ were doing the same thing, walking on the water, by the same power. If Christ had lost faith in his father, in his human condition, he would have begun to sink. So we see an example of what human beings can do through faith in God. The same water on which Jesus walked, Peter walked. And Jesus only grabbed him when he started to sink. So yes, Jesus said, come, and Peter came. Had he focused on Christ, he would never have sunk. Many of us, we take our eyes off Jesus, we start to sink, then we blame Jesus. Anyone else in the building? Yes, we have one, Pastor Zambrano, in the building. Yes, sister. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Good question. The question is, who was Ellen White? What's her role in the Adventist Church? The Seventh-day Adventist Church officially accepts Ellen White as someone who exercised the prophetic gift the way Isaiah did, or Jeremiah, or Micah, but her writings are not at the same level as the Bible. Are you following me? And she herself said that. We believe the Lord called her, and through her, he provided wisdom and counsel to guide this church from its early roots in the 1840s till it was officially organized in 1863, right up to this very point. She began her service to the church in 18, uh, she was born in 1827, she died in 1915, she served about 70 years, she is the most translated author in the history of the United States, and the third most in the entire world. And her counsel, her wisdom, has been the, one of the reasons why this church has flourished as it has from its small beginnings up to now with about 21 million members. Her prophecies, which she has given, have all come to pass so far. And the test of a true prophet is everything you say must come to pass. Not 99.9. .9. Everything you say and so far, Eloise's prophetic statements have come to pass. Also, when she was envisioned, she was examined by medical people. And she did not breathe. And if you read the story of Daniel, when Daniel was envisioned, he didn't breathe either. There was no breath in him. She didn't breathe. And she would be in vision for hours. She didn't breathe. One very, very famous event, she was in a vision, and she held out a Bible which weighed, oh, I don't know, almost 14, 15 pounds for a few hours, which uh, Mr. Universe couldn't do. She held it out for hours. In one vision, she was uneducated. In one vision, she saw heavenly bodies and described them in detail. A man listening to her was a former sea captain who navigated by the stars. And when he listened to her, he realized this must have been shown to her by God because she knew nothing about astronomy. And that's how he came to Christ, or to accept her, her, her writings. His name was Joseph Bates, one of the great pioneers of this church. So Ellen White is regarded by the church as having exercised a prophetic gift. Her writings are not on the level of the Bible. She calls them the lesser light. But as you read her words, they help you to understand the Bible more. But she herself writes, if people had studied the Bible as they ought, they would not have needed her testimonies. But I recommend read something she's written and you'll see your life change. Start with Steps to Christ. Mm -hmm. That book is non-denominational. Steps to Christ. And feel the power of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. God bless you. Yes, anyone else? Pastor Zambrano, anyone online? Oh, okay. Uh, we have uh, 10 minutes and then we're done. Thank you, Pastor. May I'm leaving on Sunday, so I'm just giving you as much time as possible. Amen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Pastor. Anyone else online? Yes, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, here is here's a question. Uh, Ruth from Zoom user. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. Can it be asked? Okay. Is marriage a covenant or a contract in the eyes of God? Is marriage a covenant or a contract? Well, a contract is a sign of is a kind of covenant. It's a, it's a con we call it a marriage contract. It's an agreement between two people, and it has conditions which both must fulfill. 
So yes, it's a contract, a spiritual one. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of contract God has with the church. Because he uses the bond between man and wife to represent the bond between Christ and his church. So yes, it's a contract. You can call it a covenant. Yes, that's fine. But the covenant yeah. of God, in God's covenant, he, he supplies all the details. We just have to decide to obey or disobey. In a marriage contract, there's contribution from both sides. Thank you, Pastor. So yes, it's a covenant and a contract, and it's for life. You can't divorce your wife because she doesn't know how to cook. It's a decision for life. <laughs> and that if people would think of that, there would be fewer marriages. It is for life. So you better choose wisely and carefully. If you want to know what a living hell is, marry the wrong person. Mm-hmm. You're stuck for life. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Lord Pastor. have mercy. All right. Yes, my good sister. <laughs> I'm glad you lowered that thing for a while. Yes, I'm listening to you. Pastor, we have one in the building. Yes. Okay. Oh, so um, this is um, a question on diet. So when you're talking about clean and unclean foods, mm-hmm. if someone brings up um, first um, Timothy chapter 4, yes. verse 4, mm-hmm. how do you handle uh, that? I'm glad. Okay, let's pray. Father, here's a common question I get. Tell me how to respond so that you are glorified and people are enlightened. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's go to First Timothy chapter 4. Verse 4. Well, let's read from verse, let's read from verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats. Now read with the which God hath what? Created to be received with thanksgiving of whom? Of them which believe, come on, and know the truth. Now, this is very important. Paul is distinguishing whom he's referring to. Those who believe and know the truth. And the truth is, some meats are clean and some are unclean. Now, within the context of those who believe and know the truth, everything is clean. He's not referring to the whole. Well, listen to the text. Commanding to abstain from meat which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them that believe and know the truth. He's referring to believers who know some are unclean, some are clean. So within the believer context, every clean thing is fine. He's not referring to the whole world where people eat snakes and slugs and cockroaches. No, 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 no. He's referring to believers. Believers who know the truth, and the truth is, some meats are unclean. So it's a restricted area that Paul is dealing with, not the whole world. But when people want to do what they want to do, they twist the Bible to suit themselves. That's why I always say, read the Bible microscopically. Thank you. We have five minutes left. Yes, my dear sister. Recognition. We have, recognition? Yes. We have in the Bible where um, th- there were people who recognized Christ's divinity. Mm-hmm. And um, it was accorded as, you know, um, them having faith or insight or that it had been revealed to them. Mm-hmm. So my question is, why when the demons recognize Christ mm-hmm. through whoever was shouting or whatever right. it, Christ asked them to keep quiet. Mm -hmm. If you read the book of John, thank you, sister, you'll find, for instance, in John chapter 2, when John's mother, when Christ's mother at the marriage of Cana said, they have no wine. Jesus said, woman, what hast thou to do with me? My hour is not yet come. Are you with me? And this theme is in John. There are other times, for instance, John 17, verse 1, these words spake Jesus and said, Father, the hour is come. Christ did things at the right time. It was not yet time to make it publicly known who he was because he did not want to be followed by thrill seekers. He wanted people who wanted the truth. And so he said, don't tell anyone. He, he silenced some demons. He told some people, don't say anything. It's not the time. And if we would live that way, we'd have a minimum of problems. You know, you're 16, you want to get married, your hour has not yet come. Are you following me? Huh? Your hour has not yet come. 
You don't have a job. You don't live anywhere. Your hour has not yet come. There's a time for everything. Christ's life was laid out by his father. And he followed it without variation. God bless you. All right. Our time is... Okay, Pastor Zambrano, the final one from Online Saint. Okay. We do have a Zoom question here mm -hmm. by Sister Marsh. Uh, Sister Marsh is asking, could you please explain more about the investigative judgment? What are the clear signs that it started in 1844? How should we explain this concept, concept to non-believers? Well, that's a big subject which I can't deal with right now. With all respect, it's a big subject. It is the very foundation of Adventist theology. Ellen White writes in the Great Controversy, page 409, paragraph 1, the scripture, which above all others, had been both the foundation and the central pillar of the Advent movement was the declaration unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. It is from that that all our present truth springs, including the health message. And so when I say you can't deal with that now, I'm very, very serious. You have to study Luke, not Luke, Leviticus 16 and parts of 23 to study the details of the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament. Because to study the gospel, you have to know how the sanctuary system worked. In the study of Leviticus, then we get an understanding as to when the Day of Atonement began antitypically. What do I mean by that? A lamb is typical, Christ is antitypical. Are you following me? The Passover feast was typical, Calvary is antitypical. The Day of Atonement, which took place on the 10th day of the 7th month in, in, in the fall, that was fulfilled October 22, 1844. Now, you would have to look at, uh, as I said, Le Leviticus 16, Leviticus 23, and parts of Ezra to see exactly when the dates, Daniel chapter 9, to finally show a person from 457 B.C. to 1844, all the events and all the Bible support. So I just can't do that now. That's a big, big study. But it is an important study. Very important, but I just can't do that now. How do you show that to somebody out of this? That takes days and days of study. When I came to the church many years ago, before any of you were born, you had to know how to explain the 2300-day prophecy. You were taught. You had to be able to explain it. And we were young people. But it's a big subject, my dear sister, who asked, and we can't handle that now. But all the information is right in the Bible. Leviticus, Ezra, Daniel, right in the Bible. Amen. It's amazing. Okay, we have to close. Amen. God is good. Amen. And all the time, Amen. let me say God bless you. Those of you online, thank you for your questions. Let me urge you as your brother in Christ, make the Bible the most important thing you eat. Jesus said in John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth gives life. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. This is what terrifies the devil when we study it and obey it. May the word of God be the love of your life until he comes to take you home. Let's stand for prayer. Oh yes, we invite you to join us tomorrow. When does the first service begin? 11 tomorrow morning when I speak to you and again at 7 o'clock. And remember, if you're in the area, come tomorrow. We can talk face to face if that's possible. I hope you will do that. Tomorrow morning, 11, and in the evening at 7, that's when we end. Father in heaven, we thank you for the joy of studying your word without interference from the authorities. We thank you for freedom of worship. Thank you for those who listen to God for the questions. And you go behind me, Father, ahead of me, and take my weak responses and clarify them to those who listened. Bless every listener to God. A special blessing on that little boy, seven years old, who asked that question, and all other children. A special blessing on visitors who tuned in. Touch their lives, Father. Help us to love you. Put that love in us for you. Put in us a love for your word, dear God, and a love for spiritual decency. Watch over us as we sleep. Bring us back tomorrow according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Welcome, friend, to 2CBN Television Network. Here, we want to preach the uplifted Savior. We want to have quality Bible seminars to help you dig deeper. We want to have interviews with shakers and movers. We want to have family, life, marriage, and youth programs. We want to have quality music. We're providing religious news, happenings in the religious world, and health issues that face the modern East African today. God bless you as you continue to watch 2CBN.